Hello, my name's Julia McCrossan, and I'm in Adelaide in South Australia, and I'm a survivor of head and neck cancer. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about sexual intimacy after head and neck cancer from a patient perspective. The purpose of my talk is to ask you to become a sex with cancer conversation champion. I want you to talk to each other and to your cancer team members about sexual intimacy after cancer. Most importantly, I want you to talk to your patients, including your head and neck cancer patients, and help provide support services so we can enjoy sexual intimacy after cancer. Now, by sexual intimacy, I don't only mean sexual function, the physical mechanics of sex. By sexual intimacy, I also mean kissing, cuddling, touching, giving and receiving pleasure. I mean that relaxed, happy confidence that your partner finds you sexually attractive. They want to share a meal, have a conversation, and physical intimacy follows. A narrow focus on sexual function alone means support from cancer teams tends to be confined to patients with cancers of the groin or pelvic area or the breast. It does lead to an over-focus on the mechanics of sex and engineering solutions. Now, of course, the mechanics, the physical side of sex are terribly important for many cancer patients. Here's a psychosexual therapist, Dr. Isabel White from the United Kingdom, and she's showing couples how to manage erectile difficulties and how to prevent the development of narrowing and shortening of the vagina after radiation therapy. However, we need cancer teams to talk to us as well, to focus on our feelings about sexual intimacy. We need cancer teams to understand that the head, the heart, and indeed the brain are important to sexual intimacy, as important as the groin. Head and neck cancer patients have treatments that leave us feeling very different about ourselves as sexual beings. Patients ask themselves questions like, how can I kiss when my mouth is, is bone dry and I don't know if my saliva is going to come back? Or if I have trismus so I can't open my mouth properly, what does this mean for intimacy? And how can my partner find me attractive again when I dribble sometimes after the surgery to my mouth or, or my face or my neck is very scarred? And how can I have sex if I've got a feeding tube down my nose or, or one through the, the wall of my stomach to enable me to have liquid food? And then those of us who've had HPV-related cancers, we face issues of stigma and fear and taboo and embarrassment and sometimes just ignorance. We ask, will I transmit cancer to my partner or has my partner given cancer to me? Has my partner been unfaithful? And may we never have oral sex again? And yet none of these questions are regularly addressed by cancer teams with head and neck cancer patients. I'll tell you just a little bit about my story. In 2013, I was treated for stage four HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer. And I was treated with 33 sessions of radiation therapy, consecutive days, and weekly chemotherapy. I was 58 at diagnosis, and I'm 69 now. And in a nutshell, 10 years later, my cancer treatment has left me physically really well and emotionally quite damaged. My physical care from my multidisciplinary cancer team was absolutely fantastic, but my emotional care was hit and miss. I found my first treatment with the immobilisation mask seriously traumatic. I sobbed uncontrollably immediately after leaving the bunker for the first time. I actually hid in the toilets so that I wouldn't alarm my partner, and I haven't been able to cry at all ever since. I think I had to hold on to my feelings, my feelings of panic in the mask, so tightly for the next 32 consecutive days that I've frozen and this has affected my capacity for sexual intimacy and also uh, for crying. Now, for other head and neck cancer patients, it's the long-term physical 
rather than emotional side effects that can cause emotional trauma ultimately. So what is my key message? I want head and neck cancer team members to start conversations about sexual intimacy in recovery as an integral part of rehabilitation and survivorship. I want you to include trained professionals like Dr. Isabel White in your cancer teams. Now, Isabel, like many others, is a cancer nurse and a senior accredited psychosexual therapist. In 2010, she established and led the first psychosexual therapy service at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London in the United Kingdom, and she worked there with cancer patients for nine years. She now works with Percy Health, and it's the United Kingdom's first virtual survivorship clinic, and it offers access to a range of multidisciplinary cancer experts, including psychosexual therapists, and they work across the United Kingdom, although she's based in Edinburgh in Scotland. And she is dedicated to raising awareness about the psychosexual needs of cancer survivors. I've done a video interview with Isabel White all about her work, and that video is on the front page of my website at juliemacrossan.com. And if you're interested in this topic, I urge you to listen uh, to this 15-minute interview. So, again, my key message, we need to develop, you need to develop, referral systems so patients who need emotional help can be sent quickly to professionals with the right training and the right experience. For example, at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse in Sydney, Australia, a senior clinical psychologist, Dr Tony Lindsay, leads a team of social workers and clinical psychologists to offer psycho-oncology support for cancer patients. And on average, they receive 60 referrals for head and neck cancer patients a year because they advertise and promote the availability of that service. Clinical psychologist Dr Tony Lindsay told me, intimacy and connection following cancer is complex and this is particularly true for those people who've experienced head and neck treatment. The treatment itself impacts on the basic acts of intimacy, such as kissing and talking but also on the way the person feels about themselves in a sexual way, how they relate to their partner, how they communicate, and sometimes how they look. For many people, sexuality and intimacy remain a taboo subject, but it is important that we as clinicians allow the space and the time to explore these issues. Now, how are you going to know if you should refer a cancer patient for emotional support, including help with sexual intimacy. Well, one service that impressed me is at Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane in Queensland in Northern Australia. Outside their radiation therapy bunkers, there are two standalone clinics. One is an educational portal about radiation therapy with visual images and information, and it's available on an app as well. But the team have also created a patient-reported outcomes automated system. They call it My Health, My Way, and it was designed for head and neck cancer patients and trialled at multiple sites. The My Health, My Way kiosk offers a standardised way for patients to regularly report the side effects of their treatment. They complete questionnaires about the physical effects of treatment, how they're coping emotionally and practically, how they're coping with the mask, and there are questions about sexual intimacy. And their replies are sent automatically to members of the team so they can get the help they need in a timely fashion. My Health, My Way is an impressive example of what should be available to cancer patients throughout their cancer journey, not just in that acute phase. So again, what is my key message? Head and neck cancer patients have double the suicide rate of other cancer patients, double. And it's four times the rate of the general population in the United States. It is time to break the silence about trauma and talk about emotional recovery and sexual intimacy with head and neck cancer patients. With HPV-related cancers, we need to start that conversation right from the start. And in Australia, a group at the University of Sydney have adapted a booklet 
called throat cancer and HPV that was initially developed at University College London. And it answers all sorts of questions, including immediately about sexual intimacy. Many patients were involved in adapting this booklet and free PDF copies are available on the Head and Neck Cancer Australia website in their HPV section. Another great booklet in Australia is published by Cancer Council New South Wales, and it's called LGBTQI Plus People and Cancer, a guide for people with cancer, their family and friends. And it's a fantastic example of simple, frank sexual information in plain language, and it covers every stage of the cancer journey. Let me finish with a, a brilliant example of a clinician listening deeply to the patient experience and taking action to prevent emotional trauma. Professor Paul Keel is a professor of medical physics and the director of the ImageX Institute at the University of Sydney. And Paul has formed a multidisciplinary team to develop an alternative to the mask for the safe treatment of head and neck cancer patients. Several radiation oncologists are members of the team, including Associate Professor Puma Sundaresan, the Chair of Head and Neck Cancer Australia. And Professor Paul Keel gave me this comment for this presentation. Until I listened to Julie, I was unaware of the depth of anxiety and distress felt by head and neck cancer patients with the mask. When she spoke, I had a eureka moment. We can use technology to adapt therapy to the patient rather than forcing the patient to fit into a mask. This idea has led to grant funding, crowdfunding and clinical trials and we're on the way to removing the mask to improve the treatment experience for head and neck cancer patients. And if you Google remove the mask ImageX Institute, you'll see plenty of information about this project and current and future clinical trials. Please take action to improve the emotional and sexual well-being of head and neck cancer patients and my genuine gratitude for listening to this presentation. Thank you.